students this morning we shall continue with this uh, english poem dog beach by matthew and all right we had seen a few lines here the poem starts in a cheerful mood and uh, the poet says the sea is calm tonight the tide is full the moon lies fair upon the straits on the french coast the light beams and is gone the cliffs of england stand glimmering and vast out in the tranquil bay come to the window sweet is the night air only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon blanched land listen you hear the breaking roar of pebbles which the waves throw back and fling at their turn the high strand begin and cease and then again begin with the tremulous currents slow and bring the eternal note of sadness in okay so the first few stanzas uh, first few lines we had taken in our last class and i told you in the introduction that uh, the poem was possibly written in 1851 when uh, when the poet parley was on uh, was honeymoon with uh, with his newly wed on the banks of a uh, banks of uh, on the uh, on the shores of dover or uh, on the strait of dover rather okay and dover he was honeymoon so the uh, the dover is uh, situated just uh, uh, on the the strait of dover is, uh, is something that links the north sea and uh, and uh, the english channel and this is the narrowest part this is the narrowest part the southern part of england where uh, uh, across if you look in about 20 miles you see the coast of france so this is that this area separates the southern england southern part of england from france okay now that's the uh, the time is night time and the uh, scene apparently is set possibly or probably in a hotel room Uh, at the at at the ta- English town of Dover, and then then as the the sea is calm tonight, the tide is full, the moon lies fair upon the straits. So he has stated it's a uh, uh, it's the tide is a high tide. Tide is full. That means so the tide at that time. Uh, is time of a high tide when the water level rises in the sea, and therefore the sea is calm tonight. Usually, the during the time of high tide, the water, sea water, is calm comparatively. The moon lies fair. The moon is shining fair brightly upon the upon the ocean, upon the sea. All right. Upon the strait, strait here is the strait so far Dover. The strait is a narrow sea that uh, uh, that separates two two land blocks. So here the southern part of England uh, is separated from northern France. Okay, for the the, the coast of France. On the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. There is still some signs of life in the on the French side of the coast, right? And the, the but it doesn't last too long. It's already gone, disappeared. That means the humanity people must have gone to sleep there. The cliffs of England stand glimmering and vast. 
Now he turns his attention from the French side or from the French coast to the English coast. And then he notices the cliffs of England. Cliffs are uh, projected rocks, huge rocks, uh, pointed rather, uh, or uh, with uneven edges leaning toward the sea. This, are the, the, this is the rocky part of uh, England. And uh, uh, another peculiar, peculiarity of uh, the beaches uh, around this part of uh, uh, England is that uh, uh, the beaches are filled with the, filled with pebbles or small stones rather than sand as you find in uh, other parts of the uh, world. So this is a peculiarity here. And the cliffs that are around Dover is mostly made up of limestones, which are not very, uh, very, very strong. They easily, uh, easily is washed down and therefore have to white in color. Okay. And upon them, the moon is shining. The cliffs of England stand glimmering. Glimmering means shining and a vast, huge, enormous, expanding, long. Out in the tranquil bay, out in the tranquil, tranquil means uh, where uh, peaceful or calm bay is a uh, area where the water body uh, comes into the land area. So, the tranquil bay, like for instance, we have a bay of Ganga, where the water comes, the sea water, the body comes into the land, a certain portion. Come to the window, sweet is the night air. Then he invites his, uh, his uh, uh, beloved, he invites her to come to the window and to enjoy the nightscape and the night air. So the night air is sweet, he says. The night air is sweet. And come and enjoy the breeze of the night, which is so soothing. And then come to the window and enjoy this beautiful sight of the rocky cliffs of England covered with the moonlight. Blanched in moonlight. Only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon blanched land. It says, only from the long line of spray. The long line of spray here means the line of the strait of the world. Where the waves. Spray is another word for uh, waves uh, making a uh, as waves uh, touch the land, it forms, uh, uh, it, it forms, it creates form, and that is called a uh, spray. Okay. Uh, spray, when the sea meets the moon plant land, so that as the, uh, the, the waves come and brace upon the land, it, uh, it uh, uh, sprays a form, or a uh, of it forms and that is what that's a beautiful side he says. Moon blanched means moon lit or moon covered with the light of the moon. Listen, you hear the grating roar of pebbles with the waves, which the waves go back and fling at their return. And I told you uh, the peculiarity of the beaches around this area of uh, uh, England was that they, uh, the beaches were made up, made up, uh, the beaches were made up, very uh, small stones or uh, pebbles, unlike the other parts of the world where you find the beaches are usually filled with the sand. And uh, as the waves come in, 
they bring along a lot of these pebbles that are lying in the in the uh, on the beach to the land and then as they return as they return as they as they return they bring it back and throw it on the land again and this creates a reacts creates a grating roar what's grating grating means an irritating sound so it's a very irritating sound stones striking against stone that sound is very irritating to your ears okay now he says uh, so you listen to this grow back as then as the you hear the grating irritating roar or mean sound of pebbles which the waves draw back that means they carry it from the land and fling at their return they carry it as they retreat from the land and then as they come back to the land again uh, they carry it along with them and fling throw throw them to the shore fling means to throw throw them at their return up the high strand high strand is the shore high strand is the shore the sea shore as they uh, return from uh, the sea the waves return they carry along with them uh, lots of these pebbles and they throw them at the beach which creates this grating roar or irritating sound begin the seas and then again begin with the tremulous cadence slow he says what is happening this happens at a regular interval at a regular interval so as it uh, uh, it uh, the waves bring this Uh, stones and throw them onto the shore, which is filled again with the pebbles, and that creates an irritating sound. And then they withdraw; they go back to the sea again, and once again they come back and fling these pebbles that they have carried with them. And this creates a A rhythmic sound. It's a it's a rhythmic movement or a, a monotonous sound, a, a continuous thing that uh, uh, happens regularly. A tremulous, trembling cadence, slow cadence means rhythm, or, uh, uh, happening at regular intervals, and bring the internal note of sadness in, and this. brings to the poet's mind a mood of depression the poet poet gets depressed by this sound the irritating sound of the pebbles being flung at this at this at this at this land or the shore all right He says, so that is a uh, something the speaker he he is uh, he is uh, see the, the poem poem started with the uh, with uh, a cheerful note. Now you will find uh, the poet has uh, changed his uh, uh, his tone toward the end of the first stanza, and the poem consists of five stanzas of irregular irregular length. Okay. So uh, five irregular stanzas, because it doesn't have consistency in the in the uh, lines uh, in any of the uh, irregular stanzas. That means the line number of lines in each stanza differs. Okay. So the pebbles are thrown by the waves, and they are brought back toward from the sea, and again thrown onto the shore. On their return journey, and this brings into his mind the the trembling rhythm of this continually 
moving uh, continuous models, uh, continue, continues and now it brings that eternal note of sadness, that eternal note of sadness which is which this monotonous monotonous sound, irritating sound of waves uh, creates uh, uh, at this the point is depressed. So the tone of the poem changes from cheerful to, to melancholy, sad. Okay. Now, let's move on to the next stanza. Next stanza. We shall proceed to the next stanza. Alright. Now, Sophocles long ago heard it on the Aegean and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in the sound a thought and hearing it by this distant northern sea. And he says, Sophocles, who was a Greek playwright, he was a Greek playwright. Who is a playwright? A person who writes dramas. He was a Greek playwright. And as he sat on the shores of the Aegean Sea, it brought, listening to this sound, this grating sound, this irritating sound of the waves, it brought to his mind the picture of human sufferings, like the muddy water, turbid air. Turbid means muddy. Okay? Turbid means muddy. Muddy. Water going in and out, ebb and flow. Going in and out. Alright. So it brought to his mind this that he felt the same eternal, eternal sadness in his in his mind, and he reflected upon the the uh, human suffering. And going by the find of human misery. And as a result of this, what happened? The Greek playwright wrote many tragedies. Tragedies are stories or dramas with a very sad ending. So he wrote tragedies on fate and the wills of God, will of God. Right? So this was the, if tragedy happened, it was either because of, if tragedy happened, it was either because of, because of fate, that is destiny, if a human suffering, I said, he was reminded of human suffering. Human suffering was caused either because of a, because of fate, that is destiny. We say also predestined. It was decided even before your birth. The stories like the antibody or Oedipus Rex. And so on. These are great tragedies. Great tragedies. Great tragedies. And Sophocles, who lived in the 5th century, wrote such, a, uh, such tragedies that are still famous. Where uh, either fate or uh, the will of God play great parts. Great parts. Okay. Now, Arnold, sitting by the 
or uh, or sitting on the shore of uh, the Straits of Dover, he experiences he has a similar feeling of sadness. Right? So the he hearing he found a feeling of sadness hearing similar sound similar sound beside the northern sea sitting sitting by the the strait of a strait of a dog far away from Sophocles place Sophocles sat on the shore on the banks of the Aegean Sea whereas our poet Arnold was sitting by the northern sea at the at the strait of Dover, the southern part of England, on the southern shore of England. And all find also in the sound and thought I hear in it by this distant northern sea. So he has a similar experience of the misery, the suffering of the human. Now then, we move, uh, so we have, we have uh, completed two stanzas. We move on to the next stanza which is lower. Uh, the third, fourth and fifth, three more stanzas left. We shall take up the next one in the next class. Okay. So that is the similarity of experiences. A great classical playwright who lived in the 15th, uh, in the 5th century BC, and uh, Matthew Arnold, who uh, lived in the mid 19th uh, century, or who writes the poem in 1851, that is uh, uh, the middle of the 19th century. Where he said he perceived the industrialized England as a chaotic, morally corrupt world. So the similarity of experience, and uh, he's trying to find out what is the what happens next to this morally corrupt world. We shall take up that in the next point, next class. We shall also see, according to Arnold, what has caused this modern situation. Okay?